This is the BBC Home Service and the British Forces Broadcasting Service. Saturday Night Theatre. We present Jane Wenham as Lynn Harker, Frank Duncan as Jason Flardew, John Pullen as Tom Swain, and Marjorie Westbury as Lady Mathry in Deal with Murder, a play for radio by Peter Cornish. Deal with Murder. Oh, damn. Oh, I'd better switch this off. Cavendish, 1592. Miss Harker? Miss Lynn Harker, the painter? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry to call you so late, Miss Harker. It's a matter of business. Oh, Lord, it had to be. Um, look, do you think it could keep? How's that? Uh, I was just going to have a bath. I have a theater date in half an hour. Oh, I see. Well, I guess we could put the deal on ice. Oh, bless you. Uh, ring me tomorrow, would you? Oh, but not before eight in the evening. I shall be out all day. We'll say ten o'clock? Uh, yes, fine. Oh, by the way, hmm? this deal, is it a portrait? Well, no, Miss Harker. It's, uh, well, it's really to do with life and death. With what? Well, I'm hoping the two of us can preserve a human life from danger. Danger? I don't understand. Oh, no, of course you don't, Miss Harker, but I'll explain everything at ten tomorrow. But didn't you just say somebody's life was in danger? That's right. Well, then who? Didn't you guess, Miss Harker? Like the song says, it's you. Well, darling, what did you think of it? Lynn? Oh. I'm sorry, Tom. What did you say? Act one. Did you like it? Oh, mm. very good. You know, I'd prefer the truth, if you don't mind. Truth? When my fiancé sits through 40 minutes of riotous fast with never a smile on her face, I'm bound to ask what's up. Tom, we're not in the courtroom now, so please don't start cross-examining. I don't have to. I know what's wrong. But, but you can't. Ah, but I do. It's Thursday. The day for Dame Hilda's sitting. You're always unbearable after Well, thanks. <laughs> Look, why don't you chuck the turps at her next time or crown her with a canvas or something? Dame Hilda's an influential woman. I'm just a struggling artist. Struggling? I'm hardly Rembrandt. Hmm, I wouldn't marry Rembrandt. Oh, Tom. <laughs> oh, whatever did I do to oh, deserve you? That sounds like an SOS. On your feet. Oh, where are we going? To the theatre bar for an inch of watered gin. At four bob a time. <laughs> You'll smile during the second act or I shall die in the attempt. <laughs> Drink's quite good. Still, you should save your money. How long does it take to save 5,000 pounds? That's rather a cryptic remark for learned counsel to me. No, not really. I had a chat with Peter Grimston at the Assizes today. Who? He's the senior partner of Grimston and Lucy, top legal firm. And he offered to take me in. Oh, Tom. Mm, be nice, eh? But it takes 5,000 quid for premium. Oh, darling. Mm, not to worry. Tough, we barristers. Still... I'd do a lot for that cash at the moment. I thought you were getting better briefs. That case you're defending in Redland. Oh, not bad. Oh, by the way, the assize is finished tomorrow, so we can spend the weekend together. Okay with you? Hmm, fine. What are you staring at? Uh, that man by the bar. Uh, which? Tall, with the permed blonde hair, rather too handsome. Oh, there, he's turning around to look at us again. Oh, no, me, he's a friend of mine. He lives in the flat above mine. Oh, really? Yes, we were at school together. But love, he looks so queer. I know, but he's not. He's an actor. <laughs> the hair's natural, and he's pretty good. Then tonight, is he, um, what do they call it, resting? Oh, even the big names rest from time to time. Oh, and um, what is his name? It's uh, Flowerdew. <laughs> Jason Flowerdew. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, how awful, the poor man. Uh, Lynn, will you shut up? He's coming over. <laughs> My dear, I'm simply ablaze with curiosity. What in the world made you pick such a catastrophe? I take it you're referring to the show, Jason. <laughs> what else? Oh, of course, one knows that farts should be played like tragedy, but the effect is intended to be altogether different. Now, look, Jason... Oh, yes, Bobbitt, I know you think I came here to prattle, whereas, in fact, I came with the most serious intention of presenting myself, Miss Harker. Of course I know who you are, and I'm simply longing to ask if I may bring my little stool and join your queue. My queue? It occurred to 
to me that one day the Navy disgusting progeny who will deny that their grandsire was ever beautiful or talented unless, of course, it's a really gorgeous portrait by you to prove the fact. Yes, but you see... Now, I, I do assure you, Mataka, I am quite unparalleled in the matter of sitting still. To say nothing of the help I could be in the arrangement of light, costume, and, of course, my dashing profile. Now, what do you say? I'm sorry, it's quite impossible. Oh, Oh, but, Miss Harker, why? Because, Mr. Flowerdew, I don't have a canvas in my studio big enough to fit your swollen head. Lit. Jason, do come and talk to Gordon Hoop. He's wittering about his musical. Oh, why, Tom. Oh, hello, Lila. Oh, everybody does look cross. Uh, uh, Miss Harker, uh, may I present my friend, Miss James? Lila, this is Miss Harker. How, How do you do? do? Miss Harker's an artist. So I gathered in the other end of the bar... My dear, you have a remarkably clear voice. It would be an asset to the profession. Thank you. Now, let me guess, Miss James. What would your profession be? She's loosely known as an actress. Loosely? Oh, darling, what were you saying about Gordon Hoop? Uh, well, he found out about the you-know-what. Oh, honestly, my dear, Lila means that madly secretive orgy we've planned for tonight. Somehow the word is out. We shall be stuffed with third-rate little monsters like Gordon. You must invite Miss Harker, Jason. Oh, uh, well, of course. I... Oh, no, not the bell. Not back-to-back -back agony. Now, come along, Jason. Gordon's waving his limp little paw. Oh, revolting little man. Look, sweeties, if you would care to come, it'll be any time after ten. My place now do try. Oh, God, sweetie, lovely to see you. <laughs> All right, then. Let's have the answer. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. That kind of I man... I said the answer. It wasn't Jason that made you this way tonight, any more than Dame Hilda. I want to know what's really wrong. Then damn well what? Oh, for goodness sake, Liam. We're going to be married one day. Haven't you ever learned to cry on my shoulder? Well, that's the second bell that isn't Well, time. we'll cut the show. Oh, no, Tom. Well, you do want to tell me, don't you? Well... Well, then I know an Italian restaurant which has gorgeous food. Now, come on, let's go. But, Tom, a phone call like that is not made by a harmless crank. Look, if he's some kind of crook extorting money with menaces, wouldn't he check on your resources first? And wouldn't he discover you hadn't the cash? He might think I could find it. Where? My family. Oh, come off it, Lynn. I distinctly remember you said your only living relative was some tatty old aunt who reared you down in Sussex. Aunt Nina, yes. Well, if she died five years ago, like you said... Yes, it... but she didn't. What? Tom, I lied to you. Aunt Nina's not dead, and no one could call her poor. Oh, that's nice. Tom, did you ever hear of the Seaton shipping line? I should hope I did. Yes, well, Aunt Nina holds two-thirds of the stock. She, what? Her father, my grandfather, founded the firm. Look, I don't get this. If your only relative's filthy rich, why keep it dark? Because we had a terrible quarrel five years ago over my wanting to be a painter. When I walked out, she cut me off. Over a thing like that? Oh, Nina's always been very much her father's daughter. Oh, that's the chap who founded the firm? Mm, Diagora Seaton, yes. Ooh, wow, what a name. <laughs> half Scot, half Greek. His brain and his will came from cold Caledonia. His passions out of Sophocles. <laughs> How his family must have loved him. His wife died after the third child. Nina was the eldest, and then my uncle Ralph, and lastly my mother. Diagoras ran their lives like he ran his business. In fact, he married Nina off to the boss of a rival firm, an elderly baronet. Didn't she kick? No. I told you she was like her father, thought the marriage her duty. Besides, being rather plain and almost 30, I think she quite fancied becoming Lady Mathry. It was the other two children who came to grief. Your uncle Ralph and your mother? Yes. Poor Ralph was much too wild to become a tycoon. In the end, he ran off to marry an actress. That was in 1932. What did Diagoras do? He disinherited him. And then he set out quite coldly to ruin him. Ralph died in 1934. Oh, boy. I pity your mother. In fact, she was rather bright. She just waited for her 21st birthday, and two days after, she married a penniless author in a registry office. Did Diagoras go into the usual routine? Yes, he cut them off. Oh. Luckily, he died of a stroke almost at once. Rage, I suppose. <laughs> so that left Nina with all the cash. Yes. And in 1940, when my parents were killed, she took me in. Ah, now I get the picture. She just acted like Diagoras when you said you meant to leave the nest. Yes, or... Well, that's what I thought. Huh? I've had a letter from her inviting me down to Frimley tomorrow. Oh, not a reconciliation. I don't know. Uh, look, it, it's in my bag. You'd, you'd better read it. Here. Oh, typewritten. She always uses a typewriter. Arthritis in her hands. Oh, I see. Now, my dear Lynette, I cannot suppose this letter will be welcome. Believe me, it is no pleasure to write. However, since certain business matters have arisen which must urgently be discussed... It is vital you should be at Frimley tomorrow. The three o'clock train from Waterloo arrives in Fulham by four. Billy will meet you. I have nothing to say until we do meet, so do not phone the house. 
You may confirm this arrangement through Mr. Thrale, your affectionate aunt, Nina. Well, Tom? Hmm, I don't know. Who's Billy for a start? The chauffeur handyman, been with Aunt Nina since he was a stable boy. Yeah. And Thrale? The family solicitor. Well, when you confirmed with him, did he tell you anything? No, he was carefully vague. Urgent business matters could mean anything. Lynn, there's only one way to find out, and that's to go. So you don't think that call I had was a clue? I mean, that someone's found out that I may be patching it up with Nina. Oh, it's wildly unlikely. And what's more, if that joker really means to ring you tomorrow at ten, you could have the police listening in to trace the call. I never thought of that. The trouble with you is you let yourself get morbid. Now, I have a cure for this. Lemonade, that pistolated yellow loochers. Jason, can it be Lila needs you? She's jumping up and down. Oh, my dear, I'll think she does. Gordon, take the bottle, darling. Passport to popularity. Excuse me. No, sorry, Bobby. You don't get up, sweetie. I'll get over you. I love you, Lila, but is it important? We need one of gin, one of whiskey, and a vermouth for the cup, and I dare not leave the bar. Right, talk to Gordon while I get it. Oh, you. no. Well, well, well. Oh, hello, Jason. Hope you don't mind us in here. Not if you don't mind me getting under the bed. What? For the emergency supplies, oh. we invited about 18 and a good 50 <laughs> outside. Oh, boo. Yes. We keep it under the bed. Amazing how people miss the more obvious places. Mr. Flowerdew. Uh, oh, do call me Jason. I'm sorry I snapped at you tonight. Oh, not at all, my fault and time. Jason, why do you behave like a chorus boy? Well. Camouflage. <laughs> With a name like Flower Dew, people expect an idiot. <laughs> Haven't you noticed when folk meet someone they take to be a fool, they always relax and become themselves? Awfully handy for me to know what they're really like. So tonight, I showed you my frightful temper. Yes. And a bit more than that. Oh, what? I think you were scared. You know, I think you rather scare me. Really? Oh, well, I suppose we are rather a terrifying profession. Much too observant, vain, ruthless. We lie superbly. It's hardly a move we make without we plan the effect. Yes, I'd uh, hate to think of a really good actor planning a crime. Would he do so well? You know, those people, he could use them like a director planning a production. See all the moves in advance, the props, the disguises. Disguises? Well, a disguised voice, perhaps. Say, uh, the sinister Mr. X on the telephone. Of course, my hypothetical actor would also make a splendid detective, but for just the same reason. Thank you, Jason. If we ever need one, we'll come to you. Ah, ah, but... Uh, how will you know I'm on the side of good? Tom, I really think we should be going. Oh, surely not. Well, I'm sorry, Jason. You see, Lynn has to meet these people tomorrow. Well, Billy, how do I look? Cityfied, that's what. <laughs> Still, bar else, I reckon you're about the same. Bless you, Billy. So are you. Even this terrible car. Billy, tell me, how is Aunt Nina? Not so bobbish, if you want the truth. Is the arthritis worse? Worse? When she hadn't sat a horse two years, and her the gun for three. Why else do you think she shut off all them upstairs rooms? If it wasn't beyond her to get there. Then where does she sleep? Bed's down next library now. Well, if it suits her. That's not a suit her gal. It's a suit Miss Terry. Who? Miss Terry. New housekeeper, companion, dinner, what all. Been here ever since Mrs. Young took off three years ago. Sounds as if you don't like her. Well, I just reckon she's a bit of a mystery, that's all. In what way? Well, you tell me why Young goes round old fashioned clothes, rare scrag bag of bun, never looks a man in the face. Could be a looker, should she try? She's young then. I'm on 30. And I seen a bit of passion still in them brown eyes hers. Now, what I reckon? Crossed in love, she were. Come to Frimley for a lick of wound. <laughs> well, that's not a crime, Billy. Well, then you should see the way she rules the roofs. Trained nurse, we told she is. So, the old devil mustn't do that, mustn't do this. The new ideas, you have to have a new telephone. Well, there always was a telephone. Nah, I mean an internal one. What? For the library, me in the harness room. Oh. To save me on necessary journeys, says she. Keep me out of the house, says I. There's no use talking. Your aunt's that fond of her, you'd think she was under a spell. 
I can hardly wait to meet Miss Terry. Oh, you'll have to, though. It's her afternoon off. <laughs> Billy. <laughs> no, don't go jogging me arm. You'll have me open the road. They've widened it, haven't they? Ah, uh, six mile now without them loops. Do the run in 15 minutes. It's unbelievable. Frimley. And it's just the same. Ah, oh, I reckon that's kept the grounds amazing well. Helps hard to find. Then who's that working over there by the lake on the tractor? Mm. That's Bob Hazelring, new home farm tenant. But the tenant shouldn't work in the park. Bob has to. The old girl made it condition of the lease. He do so many hours a week every work here. Oh, that's hard. Ah, oh, Bob hates the very sight of her, he do. Oh, Billy, look, the house. Ah, Oh, the sun reflected in all its windows, like a welcome. Do you think I'll find one, Billy? Here you are, then. Home again. Billy? Yeah, Mr. Frey, on the steps. Coming for to take you in. Best hurry, and I'll keep him waiting. Yes. I'll see you again, Billy. Ah, quarter six sharp. I'm to drive you to Front Ham. Catch the six five. Ah, oh, Miss Harker, there you are. Come along in. <coughs> Your aunt is waiting in the library. How are you, Mr. Thrale? Oh, a bit bronchial, you know. Step in, step in. Thank you. In the library, did you say? Uh, Miss Harker, wait. Yes? Uh, there's something I have to tell you. Well? I scarcely know how to begin. Lynette? Oh, dear. My aunt's waited five years to see me, Mr. Thrale. She can surely wait another minute. Mr. Thrale, send that girl in. Yeah, yes, yes, Lady Mary. Uh, please go to her. I'll speak to you later. But aren't you coming? Uh, no, I'm to wait here till I'm called. Lynette! Here, Nina! Uh, good luck, my dear. Oh, thanks. Uh, come in and close the door. There's a draft through this room like a tornado. What was it talking about out there? Thrale? Oh, Bronchitis. Oh. Well, come from the gloom, girl. Let me see you. You need more light in here. Thank you. I need no light. Sit over there. Or did you plan a dutiful embrace? Oh. Shivering, I see. Nervous, are you? No. But it's cold in here. It will remain so. I don't care for a roaring fire. Do you know why I wanted to see you? You and Thrale? No. Ah, the question of my will never crossed your mind, eh? Nina, certain things were said five years ago. Oh, would they can cancel the fact that your mother was my sister? Or you my only blood relation? I suppose they wouldn't. Perhaps you're sorry to be back here. I still prefer my own way of life. Oh, that dream of independence. Just like your mother. And your Uncle Ralph with his little actress. All of you so sure that money only stifles. Well, how's it been to have none? Not always easy. Five years ago, you wouldn't have told me that. But then, perhaps I shouldn't have shown you this. What is it? I, I can't quite see. Well, take it then. Look at it. it, it well, go on. It's a revolver. A week ago, I intended to use it upon myself. You? Impossible to imagine, isn't it? That I might come bitterly to regret driving you from here. That I actually might want you back again to end my solitude. You never told me so. No, because the very thing that parted us was the family pride, the seat and temper. Don't you see? Its power took me to the point where I was prepared to lay that cold barrel against my temple rather than admit I was wrong. Oh, Nina. Ridiculous, wasn't it? To be afraid to tell you I was wrong. Sorry that I needed you. Even when I longed to hear you say you needed me. Oh, Nina, if you only knew how many no, times I... No, no, don't commit yourself. First, hear my terms. I ask only that you should come here sometimes. Of course. And sometimes, perhaps, let me help you just a little with money. But, Nina... Now, please, let me prove myself. Let me show how generous I can be. Any reasonable sum, it is yours, I promise. What do you say? Then, Nina, there's someone I love... Oh. He, he has a wonderful opportunity if he can only raise 5,000 pounds. Ah, you know, my niece, you have made me very happy. Oh. Now, give me back that gun. And call in Mr. Thrale. I have an amusing plan in mind. No, go on, go on, call him. Oh, very well. Will you come in, Mr. Thrale? Yes, yes, of course. <coughs> 
Mr. Thrale, I have explained certain facts to my niece. Now it is your turn. Kindly proceed. Uh, Lady Maitre, I'm still most uncertain that your course is a wise Perhaps one. Perhaps you prefer me to find another lawyer. Please go on, Mr. Thrale. Uh, well, Miss Harker, entirely against my advice... Your Aunt Lady Matthew feels that the time has come for certain obligations to be... Uh, to oh, be, get on with it, man. That her obligations should be focused elsewhere. I don't understand. Don't you? Don't you, my dear niece. What he's telling you is perfectly simple. You are not going to get my money. I am leaving it to Edith Derry, not to you. It's a trick. Oh, a stupid, spiteful trick. Stupid, you think? At least I've seen beneath that proud pose of independence. I know you doubt yourself that you need my money. I hope it pleases you. One thing pleases me, that the will's drafted and will be signed tomorrow. All my money to Edith. Oh, Nina. Poor Nina. Poor? Not I. I've found someone at last who knows the meaning of unselfish devotion. Unselfish? You really think your Miss Terry hasn't worked to get your money? Get out of my house. That will be a pleasure. Let us hope it is a pleasure to walk to Frodham for Billy Sharn Drive. You, I tell you that. Good. Uh, Miss Harker, I should be happy to offer you a lift. You will remain, Mr. Thrale. We have further business. Don't worry, Mr. Thrale. I'm quite accustomed to making my own way. Hey, you want a lift? Uh, are you going to prod him? Sure. Oh. I'm aboard. Oh, thanks. That's that. Uh, well, you didn't figure to run the six miles, did you? Why, I, I'd hoped for a lift. I have to catch a train. What time does it leave? Five past five. Well, it's, uh, it's a quarter of five right now. Oh. With the new road and all, we should make it. So, Andrew's oh. away. guy. You might have run us down. You pulled out without signal. No. Oh, well, maybe. I guess I'm a little high tonight. <laughs> Last night in England, kind of celebration. I'd be okay stateside, but here they drive the wrong way around, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> That'd be just my crummy luck that crashed my last day. This is a hire car. I'm taking it back to town before I leave. You want to know something? I've been looking for an English date for a week. And my last evening she shows. It's my crummy luck. Mind that car. Whoops. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're kind of nervy, aren't you? I'm a real cool boy behind the wheel. That was Station Road. You passed it. Oh, Station Road. Will you I'm... please stop the car? I want to get out. Stop it. We were just getting acquainted. My train. I shall miss it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, I could drive you all the way. Hey, hey, where, where, where are you going? Oh, Sam. Oh, wait, please. In here, Miss Sharp. Oh, oh, thanks. Oh, I thought I'd lost it. So you're running. So Alton, do her. Uh, They'll never start to visit her, Alton. Shut that door! <laughs> There. You all right? Yes, I think so. Ah, then we can say mission accomplished, eh? <laughs> there. We're off. Non-stop for Waterloo. Yes. Oh, here. I say it. I never thought. What? Well, you don't mind, do you? I mean, us being alone like this. Two strangers in the same compartment. I've enjoyed our talk. Well, it passed the time light, didn't it? It certainly did. We're almost at Waterloo, Mr... Mike. Call me Mike. <laughs> I'm Lynn. Lynn Harker. Well, I will say you look a bit more cheerful now. Oh? Well, when you got in at Frodham, I reckon you'd have had a bit of a Barney Whip boyfriend or something. It was an aunt, to be exact. Oh, relations. Best off we out, I might say. My aunt would agree with you. She's cut me out of her will. Get away. Still, it could be for the best. You know, for 23 years... Everyone in my mum's family went in fear and trembling. My great auntie Mabel would change her will. <laughs> and when it come to it, you know what she left? A moth-eaten three-piece sweet, one of them black marble clocks, and £31.10 in a cocoa tea. Good 
evening, George. Good evening, Miss. Left working, yes? You're all right now, Miss. Oh, by the way, your Mr. Swain come out at quarter past seven. Huh? I took the liberty to let him in the studio. I knew you wouldn't be long. Oh, thank you, George. I'm glad you did. Well, it is a bit chilly down here in the fire. And he had his friend with him, you see. A friend? Do you know who? Uh, no, miss. Can't say I do. Tom? In here, then. Sorry I'm late, darling. Uh, did you give your friend a drink? Well, did you? Lynn, he's not... I mean, we've only just met him. I'm a police officer, Miss Harker. Detective Sergeant Harvey, North Sussex CID. What do you want? I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Miss. It's Lady Mathry, your aunt. Lynn, she's dead. Dead? Nina, but, but I was with her. We understood so, Miss. It was very sudden. You mean a stroke, like her father? No, Miss. At a quarter past five this afternoon, your aunt, Lady Mathry, was murdered. Oh, Miss Harker, Mr. Swain. I'm Inspector Davis. How do you How do? You do? Now, Miss Harker, uh, you know everyone but Miss Terry, I understand. Yes, she was out when I was here this afternoon. How do you do, Miss Harker? How do you do? Oh, and this gentleman here is Mr. Hazelrig, the home farm tenant. Please to meet you, Miss. Good. Then shall we sit down? I've brought you together to make it easier to reconstruct the tragic event of this afternoon. Group questioning is a great time saver. Well, of course, each of you has the right to refuse to be questioned before the others, should he or she so wish. No one? Good. Then the facts are these. Lady Mathry was shot through the back of the head as she sat here by the fire at precisely 5.15 this afternoon. You'll see the reason for my precision as we continue. We've good reason to suppose that the assailant escaped through one of those French doors, which were found open immediately after the crime. Well, how he entered the house, we have no idea. But afterwards, amongst the trees and in this mist, he'd have good cover. I shall want to ask each one of you what your movements were up to and immediately after the killing. Not because anyone is necessarily suspect, but simply to clear the ground. I hope that's understood. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Uh, now, Mr. Thrale, when we spoke informally, I, I believe you told me you arrived at Frimley Hall somewhere before four o'clock. I think about twenty to four, Inspector. Uh, dead on, sir. I was waiting for you to come so that I could leave to meet Miss Lynette. Well, why should you wait for Mr. Thrale to arrive? Well, sir, I couldn't leave her ladyship on her own. So, as Mr. Thrale arrived at twenty to four, you left to meet Miss Harker. That I did, sir. Now, the run to Frodham's about a quarter of an hour. If you met Miss Harker at four, you must have been back here by, say, 4.20? No, I was, sir. Uh, Mr. Thrale, that means you were here alone with Lady Mathry for 40 minutes. Yes, until Miss Harker arrived. And during that time, what business was discussed? Uh, Lady Mathry told me she wished to change her will. In what respect? Her desire was to revoke the previous will entirely and bequeath all she had to Miss Terry. Oh. Miss Terry? Were you aware of this? No. I'm astonished to hear it. Was it news to you, Mr. Thrale? Uh, not altogether. I think I sensed an important decision when Lady Mathry rang me two days ago to fix the appointment. In what way? There was a certain uh, mystery. Miss Harker was to come, but she was to confirm the appointment with me, not at the house. Indeed, I was not to ring the house either. And I was to give Miss Harker no information. You were in the dark then till this afternoon? Yes. We had begun merely by discussing certain matters of investment. Then, without warning, she produced a typewritten sheet on which she had made a complete redraft of her will. She ordered me to have it drawn up as soon as possible, as she wished it to be witnessed tomorrow. What was her reason for this change of heart? That Miss Terry had proved loyal and deserving, whereas Miss Harker had not. And what did you think of this? I disproved most strongly. Oh, I had nothing against Miss Terry, but the action, when it concerned so very large a sum of money, seemed to be quite irresponsible. However, there was no time to argue, as just then Billy arrived back. What happened then? Lady Bathory stated she wished to interview her niece alone. So I waited in the hall. For how long? Possibly ten minutes. And then? Then I was called in and Lady Mathry told me to repeat the terms of the will to her niece, which understandably made her very angry. I attempted to ameliorate the situation, but without success. I believe you said earlier that Miss Harker was ordered from the house and denied even a car to take her to Frodham. Yes, Lady Mathry also detained me so that I too could not assist Miss Harker. Uh, what was the time she left? I think roughly 20 to 5. Oh, yes, it must have been, because I arrived at Frodham in time to catch the 5-5 to Waterloo. We'll return to that later. Now, Mr. Thrale, 
When did you leave Lady Mastery? About uh, five to five. Are you positive of the time? All I know is that I was back in my office by 5.15 to keep an appointment. Well, I know Mr. Frail left at five to five. Because I seen his tail lamps going off down a drive and I looked out me harness room window. Ah, it was then, I think you said, Billy, that Lady Mathry rang you on the internal telephone. Ah, she rang me that very minute to say Miss Lynette had already left and I wouldn't be needed. So then I asked her, does she want me to sit with her, same as always, till Miss Terry get back at six? But she refused. That she did. Said she, oh, no, can't be disturbed. So we know she was alive just before five o'clock. Now, I want you to tell me again exactly what happened during the next 20 minutes. Wow. First few minutes, Bob and me was brewing up, having a little chat. Ah, uh, phrase, Inspector. I comes out to Billy special for here, the cereal. What I'm used to call children's hour. Uh... Yeah. I just listen at home, see, because we wife the laugh. Yeah, all right, all right. You came to hear the cereal at 5.15, and then? Ah, uh, do you tell him, Billy? Why, sir? I'm just turning on the wireless about a minute to four quarter past when the telephone rings. Well... Bob were none too pleased, I'll tell you. Oh, why she had to pick this time? Blowed if I know. Yes, my lady? Billy. Yes, my lady? Get your rifle, Billy. My? Get what? Get your rifle and come over at once. Hurry, man. There's someone outside. Quickly, Billy. So you actually heard the shot? I did, sir. Bob and all. And we legs it all to the house. But we was too late. Did you ring the police at once? Bob done that, sir. I goes to get out the killer through them Frenchy doors. Well, what hope had you of seeing anyone in the dark and with a thickening mist? Well, I knows the ground, don't I? Yes, but there are three ways at least he could have gone. Down the drive, back round the house, or up the track to the home farm. Aye, sir. But then when I thinks, I reckon he'd make for main road. Especially as if he come by car. So you went that way? I did, sir. But there weren't nothing to see. Well, at least we know where you, Mr. Hazelrig, and Mr. Thrale were at 5.15. So, Miss Terry, let's turn to you. Yes. At 5.15, where were you? In the Pantheon Cinema at Frodham. You would left the hall at 2 o'clock, I believe. Yes. I caught a bus outside the gate. So you'd be in Frodham by about 2.20? I suppose so. I was in good time for the film at 2.30. I thought the cinema opened at 1. It does. But the second feature's often bad, so I usually go into the main film first, and then if I don't like the second feature, I can come out early. But in this case, you saw the whole program. Yes. Now, the program today ran three hours, so you must have left the Pantheon at, say, 5.30. Well, I easily caught the quarter to six bus back. And found us here when you returned at five past six. Well, I expect it won't be hard to check with the bus conductors both ways, but I wonder if you were seen in the cinema. Well, I imagine so. It's not a big place, and being afternoon... It wasn't crowded. Hmm, that leaves us with you then, Miss Harker, doesn't it? First, from the time of your arrival here at 4.20, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't heard? I'd like to say one thing. Yes? When Mr. Thrale said I was angry, it wasn't about losing the money. I was angry because of the trick my aunt had played. Trick? She'd pretended she wanted a reconciliation. When I admitted I'd be glad of one, she told me the truth about the will. That seems unusually vindictive. I think her illness had made her so. No doubt. Now, Miss Harker, will you tell me in your own words what you did from the moment you left here up to the moment you arrived in your flat at Regent's Park? Uh, it was 20 to 5 when I left. Uh, by the front door or, or that French door? The front. I went down the drive. I suppose in the dark you'd not notice anyone. Well, apart from that, I was too angry. In fact, I'd got to the gates before I remembered that I hadn't said goodbye to Billy. But you didn't turn back. Well, I nearly did. And then I glanced at my watch and saw that if I hurried, I'd a chance to catch the 5-5 back to Waterloo. Just one hour earlier than had been intended? Yes. Weren't you rather optimistic in hoping to make the six miles to Frodham in 20 minutes? Well, there was a lot of traffic on the road. I got a lift almost at once from an American. Can you identify this American? Not by name. Well, then can you describe him? He was about 26, blonde, square-faced, and he was rather drunk. Yet you accepted a lift from him? It didn't show till we moved off. He drove badly? Well, the first thing he did was just miss a big blue and white van that was overtaking. In fact, the whole journey was pretty awful. Do you remember what sort of car he had? Yes, I'm good at cars. It was a Pontillac, pale green. I remember he said it was hired. He was driving it back to town because... Well? Because it was his last day in England. I see. So even if this man was sober enough to recall the precise time he gave you a lift, he may well be out of the country by now. All right, Miss Harker. Tell me about the rest of the journey. Well, he dropped me at the bottom of Station Road in Fodham. 
I ran into the station and found the Waterloo train just about to leave. Would a ticket collector or porter remember you? He might do, but with the rush hour, the station was pretty crowded. Quite. Now, when did you arrive at Waterloo? 6-5. It was dead on time. Miss Harker, do you remember my sergeant phoned me from your flat? I do. He told me you'd returned a moment or so after 7.30. That's right. Now, your flat's in Regent's Park. From Waterloo on the tube to Regent's Park is only a matter of minutes, but you, it seems, took an hour and a half. I was talking to a friend. I see. Where was this? In the bar on Waterloo Station. Perhaps I might have the friend's name and address. I'm afraid you can't. Why not? He was just a man I'd met on the train. I knew nothing about him except his name was Mike. Yet you sat in this bar with him for over an hour. Look, I know it sounds silly, but somehow we got talking on the train. And just before we arrived, I started to tell him about my row with Aunt Nina. I think he sensed I wanted to finish the story, so on the platform he suggested a drink. Can you give me any definite point of information about this man? He was about 30. Dark hair, a northern accent, uh, brown eyes and a small moustache. He was wearing a gabardine Macintosh and he had a suitcase. At what point on the line did he get into your compartment? He was already there at Prodham. He'd held the door open for me to delay the train. Was anyone else in the compartment? No, the train was almost empty. Did this Mike tell you where he was going? Well, he may have set up north. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And there's nothing else about him you can tell me after a total of two hours' conversation. I'm sorry, no. I see. Well, thank you, Miss Harker. Is that all? For the moment. In fact, everyone's free to go. We'll notify time of inquest. Thank you, Inspector. I shall be in my room, should you want me. Lynn, how do you feel? I'm all right. Oh, give me, Mr. Swain. Uh, Miss Harker, I forgot to ask. Are you returning to town tonight? No, not tonight. In fact, I may have to stay on here for several days. Now, family matters, yes, of course. Uh, we can reach you here at the hall, then. No, 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 not at the house. I, I couldn't. We'll be putting up locally, Inspector. Well, if you want a good hotel, sir, I could recommend the Ra- Raven at Frodham. I'd already decided that would be a good place. Thanks, Inspector. How did you manage, Tom? Oh, charm prevailed. We've two single rooms, one with bath, both with box spring. Do you think we'll sleep? Oh, poor darling. It's been a terrible day for you. Oddly enough, it isn't the murder that counts. I haven't yet taken that in. Then what? It's a feeling I have that Inspector Davis didn't believe a word I said. Oh, the famous official manner, my love. Why shouldn't he? But what happens if they don't find that American or the northerner I met on the train? If they find the real murderer, they may never have to. And if not? You're tired, and we both need a drink. Waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, Two gins and tonic. Right away, sir. Tom, if you were Davis... Would you think I was lying? Not for a moment. You weren't smooth enough, for one thing. No, if I were Davis, I'd take a long, hard look at Miss Terry. But, Tom, she had no motive. Besides, she was miles away. Well, maybe. But what I mean is, she was altogether too self-possessed. Wasn't she supposed to adore your aunt? So Billy said, we don't know. But how would you feel if you were told you'd nearly been left a fortune and then had lost it again? I imagine her kind is born to suffering and endurance. Oh, don't you believe it. Did you notice her eyes? Billy said there was passion still in them. Is that what you saw? No, Lynn. What I saw was hatred. Hatred? But who for? Your drink, sir. Oh, thanks. How much? Five shillings, sir, if you please. Uh, Here you are. Thank you, sir. Well, here's how. Cheers. You know, I'm absolutely starving. (laughs) Oh, Tom. Oh, you are wonderful. All right. Get some sandwiches. Oh, I can do better than that. Oh, you won't at ten o'clock at night at Frodo. Have you forgotten the fish and chip shop down the road? Oh, no, Tom. I couldn't walk a step. Oh, that's all right. I'll nip out and smuggle the stuff back in the briefcase. (laughs) Illicit fish and chips in the bedroom. Sounds wonderful. Well, you stay here and tipple, then. Uh, Don't get yourself picked up. Miss Harker... Yes? Phone call for you, miss. For me? Box two, miss. Down the hall by reception. Oh, thanks. Hello? Good evening, Miss Harker. You? Well, you seem surprised. After all, we did arrange for ten o'clock. How did you know I was here? Oh, now, Miss Harker, from the moment you received your aunt's letter, a certain mechanism was set in motion. (sighs) It's quite inevitable you should be there just as it was for me to be in the library at Frimley this afternoon at 5.15. Oh, no, that's too horrible. You are too harsh. I killed with kindness. In the words of that poem of Browning, no pain felt she. The man in that poem was insane. I, on the other hand, have a most definite aim in view. Aim? What aim? That you should take the blame. What are you talking about? The deal I mentioned, Miss Harker. 
I'm telling you now that unless certain conditions are fulfilled, you will never see those two witnesses, the blonde American and the talkative northerner. What? It is my intention that sooner or later you will pay for those witnesses whom I have, uh, well, detained. You really think I shan't tell the police about you? You must do as you please. In the meantime, I shall be glad if you'll tell Mr. Swain I propose to call him at his flat tomorrow evening. Well, why should you call Tom? Because, Miss Harker, to put it tactfully, by then you won't be available. Now, let's take it calmly, Miss Harker. About what time was this call? Just after ten last night. I'd like to lay my hands on him. Lynette was almost hysterical when I got back. But you both left reporting the matter till this morning. Well, I tell you, she was at breaking point. Besides, we knew by then the call couldn't be traced. You say this call was the second you'd received? Yes, the first was at my flat on Thursday. Well, why didn't you tell me about it at Frimley last night? It seemed to have no connection with the murder then. The call had been threatening but obscure. We decided to ignore it unless it was repeated. And why did this caller threaten you on the first occasion but claim he'd murdered your aunt on the second? Both times he mentioned a deal. At first, obscurely, it was only last night he told me that the murder had been done to implicate me. Impli oh, how? Unless I paid, he said he would withhold the two witnesses who could prove I wasn't at Frimley at 5.15. Withhold? By kidnapping? I... We both think it's a conspiracy. Ah, so we're to suppose the blonde American was actually waiting for you outside the hall last night. But he could have been, Inspector. Yes, and then you think, having driven Miss Harker to Frodham, he, as it were, handed her over to accomplice number two on the train, who in his turn later delayed her at Waterloo. Well, he might have done. No, sir, he might not. For the simple reason, Miss Harker was to have left the hall in the car with Billy at a quarter to six. Now, who could possibly know there would be a quarrel with the result that she left over an hour earlier and on foot? All I know is he had said he had planned to trap me. Very well. How would this caller, call him X, know about your planned visit? Well, that's easier, Inspector. We're certain X, as you call him, was tipped off by one of the four people involved. I assume by those you mean either Miss Terry, Mr. Thrale, Billy or Bob. Yes, no one else could possibly know. Didn't you, for one? Well, that's ridiculous. In any case, I was in It's no more ridiculous than to accuse one of these four people, none of whom has a motive. Who says they haven't? Well, take Miss Terry. If Lady Mathry hadn't been killed, the will was to have been changed in her favour. So by the murder, she lost. She said she didn't know about the change. She must have suspected something was up with Thrail and yourself invited, in which case she would have waited. But besides, how could Miss Terry conspire with anyone? She, she never went outside the hall by the odd half day and scarcely looked at a man. All right, Inspector. She's unlikely, but what about Thrail? He knew Lynn was coming. Again, no motive. Well, he might have been embezzling the old woman's money. It's happened with lawyers before. Then the moment she died, he'd be exposed when the will was probated. And I assure you, he's no spender. He's a quiet, modestly living bachelor who's lived in the district for years. There's still Bob Hazelrig. Billy told me he hated my aunt. A man who listens to children's hour. Besides, he was with Billy when the shot was fired. Or do you suspect Billy as well? Oh, no, it couldn't be Billy. He adored Nina. So, we've exhausted the four suspects but by no means the questions. Well, apparently, Mr. X wants money, but why should he think you can pay him? The will won't be settled for six months. Perhaps it was done for spite, not money. Then why mention a deal? Or do you imagine three people work together for no payment? The informant, the American, and the Northern? Well, we're no soon enough. Mr. X is phoning me tonight. Surely that will convince you. A voice on the end of a line would convince me of nothing, sir. A voice cannot produce a missing witness. If only I knew why you wouldn't believe me. I'll tell you. I think we've agreed that neither Miss Terry, Mr. Thrale, Billy, nor Bob has a motive. It's also certain none of them could have done the murder. Mr. Thrale was in his office at 5.15. Miss Terry was in her cinema. We checked the cinema cashier and the buses both ways. Billy's story tallies with Bob's in every detail. But your story, Miss Harker, is another matter. Well, of course. Not merely because of the missing witnesses, but because no one on the station remembers you running for the 5.5, not even the guard. Nor does anyone recall you in the bar at Waterloo. I told you, last night, it was crowded. Then let's come to hard facts. Early this morning, we found the revolver that killed your aunt. It was hidden in undergrowth about 50 yards from that French window. Two shots had been fired from it, and ballistics confirmed that one of them unquestionably killed Lady Mathry. On the weapon was only one set of fingerprints. Yours. That's utterly fantastic. Do you deny having seen this revolver before... It's my aunt's. Yesterday, when we were alone together, she handed it to me for a moment. One more fact you didn't mention. I never connected the two weapons. Why aren't her fingerprints on it, too? She, she, she was wearing cotton gloves. She, she had arthritis in her hand. She wore no such gloves when her body was found. Well, Nor she... was there any sign of them in either the library or the adjoining bedroom. And there's one more fact. Miss Terry has told us Lady Mathry never owned a revolver. Do you believe her? It seems easier than to believe your story. Inspector. Now, listen. You're intelligent people. 
See the facts from my point of view. Miss Harker, you are known to have a bad temper. There was a quarrel. From a quarter to five until half past seven, you can't account for your movements. The revolver bears your fingerprints. And what is your defense? An incredible story of a planned extortion which must have involved three or possibly four people. I ask you, does it seem likely? Of course not. He didn't want it to seem likely. Miss Harker, don't you think it would be easier for us all if you admitted these calls are a fabrication? But they're not. Won't you admit that when you left at a quarter to five, you hid in the trees until Mr. Thrale had left? No. And then, overhearing Lady Mathry tell Billy she wanted to be alone, you entered the house and killed her. How could I? The house was locked. Had you no key? You'd lived at the hall for many years. I had none. Even if I had, how would I get back to Frodham after the murder? As you said, you got a lift, but at about 5.20, and you banked on the driver not remembering the exact time. No! You arrived at Frodham around 20 to 6, caught the 6.5 back to Waterloo, arrived there at 7.5, and were consequently home in your flat by 7.30. But I didn't! I swear to you, it's not true! Why won't you believe me? But my dear old Tom, murder, they can't. It's a prima facie case. She was charged and brought before the magistrate this afternoon. Oh, it's a nightmare, Jess. Oh, but, Tom, they're sure to find the truth soon. Why, Lila? The really important evidence Davis discounts. He practically said Mr. X is a gimmick Lynn devised to get her out of a tight spot. She's been splendidly framed, I will say. Means, motive and opportunity for Lynn who didn't do it, and apparently no means, motive or opportunity for anyone else. No wonder Mr. X is so sure of himself. Jason, it's because of that I've asked you down here. Mm -hmm. You remember X said he'd ring me tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, 20 minutes ago he did, and I've recorded the call. Now, Jason, it's a long shot, but you're an actor. I'm asking you to listen and tell me if you can deduce anything from the voice. <laughs> Love, you don't mean you took all that stuff I handed you about an actor making a superb detective series? No, no I don't say that, but an actor has a different angle. You might just spot something. Well, let's hear it then. Right. Here goes. Speaking. I won't waste your time. The deal is as follows. In return for a certain sum of money, I will provide the witnesses who traveled with Miss Harker on the train and spoke with her at the station bar. How much? Well, my terms in cash are 50,000 pounds. Are you out of your mind? I'm aware you think Miss Harker can't raise such a sum. But if you see Mr. Thrail on Monday and explain everything, I guarantee he'll indicate a way. And what sort of guarantee do we get that this witness will appear? There's only one guarantee, Mr. Swain. But unless you do as I say, he Hello. will not. Hello? Or do you propose to send your future wife to the gallows? I may tell you that at the moment she doesn't believe you hold a witness. Oh, well, then ask her if she remembers the three-piece suite and the black marble clock. The what? She'll know. I'll ring again on Monday evening to instruct you how the money is to be handed yes, over. Did. Good night. Well, Jason. Well, Tom, we've... Uh... We both spotted a sweet smell of grease paint. Eh? It's an act, of course. Mr. X is no American. Now, I noticed he said ring for call myself. Ah. Mm. Besides which, the accent wobbles from a curious deep south to an even curiouser Chicago. But, you know, I'm not concerned with the accent, but the effect he wants to produce. Meaning? It's a sort of um, magician's act, where to think he's all-powerful, yet quite invisible. Hmm, he's not doing badly. Davis doesn't even believe X exists. But then Davis isn't rooting for Lynn, as we are. Even so, he's behaved in a very unpolicemanlike way. Huh. You remember you suggested that X could only have found out about Lynn's visit from Miss Terry, Thrail, Billy, or Bob? Yeah. All right. What did Davis say? He said it was impossible. None of them had a motive. You see? He'd forgotten that in crime, as in a conjuring trick, you don't first ask why, you ask how. How, mm. for example, since it wasn't a break-in, did the murderer enter Frimley Hall? Answer? With a key. Now... Who could give him a key but one of the four? Well, clever old Sherlock. Mm, but the real pointer to inside information is when X is so sure Thrail will cooperate in raising the cash. So Thrail might have informed X, given him the key, and let him do the murder. I'll admit he could be the informant, could even have provided a key. Or possibly left the front door on the latch when he left, but X is not the murderer. Oh, really, Jason? Yes. Listen, listen, there are only two reasons for using a fake voice. To evade future recognition, or because Lynn has already heard his real voice. Well, well, deep under that bogus accent, I detect North Country vowels. And I remember Mike. But you can't think Mike and X are one and the same. I don't know. But if Mike equals X, he couldn't be the murderer because at 5.15 he was speeding towards Waterloo. Oh, but you can't assume that because of a voice, Jason. Exactly. We'd have to have some definite proof Mike's not a completely innocent witness. If Mike's completely innocent, why is X so sure he'll do what he says? And don't tell me Mike's been kidnapped. Why not? Because, poor fool, an innocent Mike must have been going somewhere and would by now be missed. Besides, X couldn't kidnap Mike unless he too was on the train. No, as soon as you analyse Mike's actions, it's obvious his purpose was to isolate Lynn. Why else 
Did he open the compartment door for her? Why else did he delay her in the bar at Waterloo? And think how little he said of himself in an hour and a half's conversation. All right. Mm. Assume Mike's an accomplice and possibly X himself. If he's not the murderer, and if it wasn't any of the four obvious suspects, who was it? I know. The American and the Pontillac. My dear, I dismissed him ages back. He's got absolutely nothing to do with any of this. Well, prove it. Look, he dropped Lynn at Frodham two minutes after five, right? Right. He then had to turn his car, make the six miles back to the hall, park his car, proceed through the grounds on foot, and reach the library in just 13 minutes. Simply couldn't be done. But he could still have been an accomplice. Ah, no, Davis spotted the flaw in that. No one could possibly know Lynn would quarrel with her aunt and leave on foot. Mm, I've just thought of something. Hmm? If no one could know when Lynn would leave Frimley Hall, how could Mike know which train Lynn would catch? Oh, that's easy. He was early at the station, hung about till he saw her, and then nipped to the train just ahead. Wrong again. If he were over an hour early, as Lady Bracknell says, he'd expose himself to comment on the platform. Oh, all right. You tell us how. Isn't it obvious the real murderer at Frimley tipped Mike the wink Lynn was on her way? How, Jason? My phone, presumably. There's no phone box anywhere near the hall. Then from inside. Yes, and Thrale was there at the time. But the phone stood right beside Lady Mathery in the library. Well, he could easily have used some innocent code word as a warning. It certainly looks like Thrale's your man. Yes, I'm sure of it. Miss Teddy would have lost by the murder. Bob could never have organised it, and Billy's the last one on earth to have tried. Yeah. Thrale, then, assisted by two outsiders. Yes. I'd give a lot to know what he's been up to during the past few weeks. Isn't it Friday night we're concerned with? No, Tom. The conjurer did his act very nicely and convinced his audience. But a conjurer has to prepare his act and clear up afterwards. Before or after, that's where we'd nail him. Would you be interested to try, Jason? Huh? We found out more in half an hour with you than in two days with Davis. Ah, uh -huh, but the big rule in detective fiction is don't cross the police. If I go around questioning people, Davis will clap me an eye. Uh, but a little discreet investigation into the background of those concerns, surely that would do no harm. Well, you, you know, it's intriguing. A detection where none of the direct participants would be questioned. You'll do it then? Uh, provided you go straight to Thrale tomorrow and tell him with tears in your eyes how you intend to cooperate with X up to the hilt. And while I'm lulling him into a sense of security... I shall be lurking in the background asking subtle questions. Beginning, I think, with Billy, who, from what I hear, seems to be a man of strong opinion. But, Jason, why on earth in the middle of Frimley Woods? The morning's fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? Well, if you mean the view of the hall through these binoculars, then no. I suppose you'd approach the front door and announce to Miss Terry you'd come to investigate a murder. Well, I certainly wouldn't expect Billy to appear out of a bush in Frimley Woods. Does it occur to you that at any minute Billy will have his lunch? Oh, I see now. You think he'll come up this track through the woods? Uh, by golly, yes. Well, what is it? Here he comes now. Hmm? Now, it all depends on whether he makes off down the drive or turns up here towards us. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes, he's coming towards us. And the dog. Dog? He's got an Alsatian with him. Quiet, you go. Quiet, damn you. Good morning. That's, uh, that, that, that's a fine dog. Uh, she don't like trespassers, nor yet getting reporters. If I was you, I'd make back for main road. Yeah, but we're not reporters. Yeah? Really. How'd you know my name, eh? But Billy, we're friends of Miss Harker's. If that's it, why is you lurking about up here, eh? There's something we have to discuss with you in private about the murder. Yes. Hmm? You mean, away from Miss Terry? Uh, yes. So you reckon it was her, do you? Like me and Bob. Well, we're not quite certain. Oh, of course she did it. What she did was going to pitch her ass bit the front and then slip out the side. Bob read where a woman done that in a thriller. It's in every thriller, I believe. The only thing is, how'd she get out here and back again? Too dangerous to beg a lift. She can't drive. You're sure? Well, why she been catching buses, Elsie? Three years past, she can. Besides, where'd she get a car from? she had been out in Frodham. Yes. Then why do you suspect her? Because the inspector said whoever it was had a key. Yes, but it's possible an outsider could have got one. Now, now, just you wait. Hmm? They reckons the killer got in just after Mr. Frey left, didn't he? Between five to five and a quarter past. Well, now, I swear during that time, you know, he had never barked. So it was from on what she knew. Where's the dog kept, Billy? Outside of back door on a chain. Used to run wild, but then she got a bit savage, see? Could you be sure she'd hear someone creeping up at the house from the front? Oh, remarkable fine ears that has. And if she don't know someone's step, she barks. That's why I told that Davis to put Miss Harker. See, Juno didn't know her. Ah, very good point, Billy. 
Unless possibly someone entered the house earlier that afternoon. How could they? I'll right in the front driver, clean the car till Mr. Frail oh. come. Can you be sure Miss Terry didn't leave a door or a window open somewhere on the far side? Oh, I can. See, when she left a five to two for the bus, I remember her stopping me to ask I should fix a nail on the cellar door where she'd scratched her hand. Yes, but that doesn't... Now, 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 let me finish. Last Friday, it was me old woman's day for clean at the hall. And it was her went round the place locking up. And that didn't leave till up asked. I see. So you're certain no one might have slipped in when you didn't notice? I was right there, slap before the house, I tell you. What's more, every few minutes I go across the library window, take a peep at her ladyship. Why was that? Well, she always had a nap from two to half past three, and I'd keep watch like. Oh. In fact, I had to wake her at half past three by tapping on the glass. I suppose you could see Bob Hazelrig all the time, too. He was down by the lake from start to finish. For a minute, round 25 past three, when he come up to borrow a match. Mm. So you were at the front of the house, the dog at the back, the place locked, and there were no visitors. Right, sir. Less than you can to the laundry, in course. Huh? But he don't even get out the van. He's that scared the dog. How can a laundryman deliver if he doesn't get out of the van? Well, he drives round the back, see? Slings out the clean stuff on the kitchen porch. Carries on round the yard till he gets to the wall where we leaves the dirty. And then picks that off the top as he goes by. Oh, Hmm. Uh, just for interest, uh, when did he come? Uh, three o'clock, near enough. I suppose you know the driver. Oh, I does. He's been a driver for Frodham Laundry, best part three years. So there it is, Tom. Even more of a tangle. All I can suggest now is that Thrail let somebody into the house while Billy was meeting Lynn. The dog has dished us. Well, there wasn't much hope anyway. You haven't told us yet how Thrail took the story of X and the 50,000. Precisely like a lawyer. Insisted we should go to the police. For a time, that is. Ah. Oh, then it could have been an act. How did he end up? After a lot of humming and whoring, he conceded it was an emergency. Mm, I thought him. It seems that Diagoras Seaton invested the sum of 20,000 pounds back in 1918 as a kind of emergency fund for any member of the family in need to be drawn upon at the discretion of the trustees. Now, those originally were Diagoras himself, his daughter Nina, her husband, and Thrail. Of whom now only Thrail remains. Yes, with absolute power to withdraw the sum for Lynn. Oh, some coincidence. Except that it's less than half what Mr. X wants. Oh, no. At compound interest over 40 years, the sum is now just over 50,000. Then oh. we really are getting somewhere. Jason, that's not evidence, and what's more, I don't want it to be. I'm not with you. I want us to give up, Jason. Well, do you remember, X told me to mention a marble clock and a three-piece suite. Well, that did it. Lynn says that something Mike said to her on the train... So it's even more likely that X is Mike. That you fix it with the police and nab him when the handover is made. No, Jason. And... I'm going back to town tonight and I'm going to agree to whatever X says and I'm going to tell no one what that is. I... I promised Lynn and that's what I'm going to do. There's no other way and it's no use arguing. He was really scared, wasn't he? Scared and determined. I know that look from school days. It's no use trying to persuade him. So, what do we do now? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm making back to town. Oh, but Jason... Well, let's argue about it when we cross the road, shall we? Oh! Oh, did you see that idiot from the big white van? He missed me by an inch. No, Lila. It wasn't just white, it was blue and white. Well, be damned to the decor. I was nearly butchered. Oh, I wonder. A blue and white van with a legend, Frodham Laundry. Sometimes I wonder if you're all there. Lila, do you remember Billy said the laundry delivered on Friday afternoon? Well, what about it? Well, do you remember that it was also on Friday afternoon that a big blue and white van nearly crashed into that Pontillac? So? So the laundryman might just conceivably remember a girl getting a lift, mightn't he? And he could provide an alibi. Why not? If you were to inquire at the laundry, which chap it was... Me? Did you say me? Yes, dear. I feel that here is an A1 chance for you to practice your sultry sirens act. My uh, secretary says you wish to see me, Miss uh, uh, Jane. So very kind of you to spare the time, Mr... Uh, Frisbee, Mr. Frisbee. Oh, you were the manager? I am, yes. Oh, you see, it's such a big laundry that I didn't expect anyone so... so young or so... Uh... Oh, well, we're pretty progressive, you know. Yes, pretty progressive. I'm sure you have a hand in quite a lot of things, eh? Oh, well... <laughs> For example, well... <laughs> the colour scheme of those delightful vans of yours. Uh, vans? Yes, it's because one of them that I'm here, Mr. Frisbee. Oh, not a collision, I hope. Oh, no. You see, last Friday at about three o'clock, I was going along the Frimley Road when I saw one of your vans turn out at Frimley Hall. And as it did, 
This sort of fell from the back. Fell? What is it? Well, I don't know. Naturally, I wouldn't dream of opening laundry property. Oh, but it's not. It must be the private property of the driver. Oh, then perhaps you could return it to him, if, if you know who he is, of course. Oh, indeed. There could only have been one then in the Fribley area on Friday. Potter. Oh, I think it's marvellous how you know. Uh, yes, but you see, Potter left our employment last Friday. Oh, how irritating. It certainly was, in more ways than one. Oh, but uh, you wouldn't be interested in that. Oh, but, Mr. Frisbee, you've no idea how interested I'd be. Oh, well, you see, he let me down. Oh, dear. Oh, he gave notice in the usual way. But because he'd always been such a respectable chap, uh, worked here almost three years, you know, I made an exception in his case, uh, stamped his cards up to date, gave him his money at lunchtime. Yes. He told me he'd a train to catch right after work. And then when I went into the transport section at five, I found his van returned. Left half an hour early. Well, Mike Potter needn't apply for references to me. Mike Potter? Is anything the matter, Miss James? No, I just... I mean, what a pity we've no way of tracing him. I don't suppose you know where he was going. Only somewhere up north. But of course he had lodgings here. No doubt his landlady has a forwarding address. Mr. Frisbee, I don't suppose you could find her address for me. Yes, I think I have it here in the file. Tempting, Lila. It's terribly tempting. So you agree that Mike, alias Mr. X, could also be this laundryman? Well, the facts fit. Say Mike was waiting on the lay-by for Lynn to emerge, as he thought, in a car. Yes. And then saw her on foot, getting a lift from the American. He then overtook the Pontillac, hurtled onto his depot, and dashed from the station. So there was no need for any phone call from Thrail. I'm beginning to wonder if Thrail had any connection with this. In fact... I have the beginning of a superb idea, the way the murderer got into Frimley Hall. Well, come on, then. You remember, Billy said the van went round the back of the house but didn't stop. Yes. Well, what if, during the split second the van was out of sight, a passenger had jumped from the back? A passenger who not only knew the dog, but who also had a key. A passenger whom we now know couldn't have been Thrail, Billy, or Bob. But Miss Terry, driven there from Frodham. Yes, yes Jason, it fits. Uh, let's try it for time. Mm. Uh, Miss Terry entered the cinema at 2.30. Mm -hmm. Say she left at 2.45 and met the van in Frodham. She could be at the hall by three and inside the place before Thrail arrived. Then she hears Lady Mathry announce when Thrail has gone that she wishes to be alone and nips in to kill her. Dashes out of the French door, chucks away the revolver and... Oh. What's up? Well, how did she get back to Frodham in time to catch the quarter to six bus? Uh, she had, say, 25 minutes plus. How about if she'd hidden a push bike among the trees? In the dark, she'd not be recognized on the road. Well, I suppose she could have done, though I can't really see her on one. Or well, for that matter, it seems awfully hard to connect that genteel lady's companion with a North Country van man, doesn't it? Well, they've both been in the district three years. That's something... And there's still not a vestige of motive. Well, that may come if we can once prove a link between her and Mike. Mm. And obviously the place to begin is the chap's digs. Oh, no, no. He didn't leave no forwarding address, not Mr. Potter. He didn't have to if you follow. Uh, I'm afraid I don't, Mrs. Beasley. I mean, he'll be back, see? Back? When? Oh, I couldn't say, I'm sure. But it stands the reason he'll come back for his scooter, done not it? Oh, oh, yes. I noticed it in the lane beside the house. Besides, he'd never go off and forget old friends, not Mr. Potter. Ever such a nice lodger he was. Never no nasty drinking or noise. Happy as a sandboy, just watching the telly or going to the local rep. He liked the theatre? Oh, crazy for it he was. Collected all them old programmes and theatrical pictures. I used to tell him... You could be an actor yourself, Mr. Potter, with your looks, but he just smiled. Shy, you know, not even a girlfriend. Uh, well, um, uh, perhaps if I leave this parcel with you, Mrs. Beasley, you could return it to him when he comes. Well, of course I will. I'm glad you caught me in. I'm usually down the factory till six. Goodbye. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ta-ta, then. Come on. I wonder what he would think of that parcel if he ever opens it. Three packets of potato crisps. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the connection between Potter and Miss Terry is getting clearer. Mm. Ten to one, he wasn't really a vanman at all, but an actor. I always said there was a smell of grease paint about this. Both of them apparently shy and never meeting the other sex. Oh, by the way, uh, what about the motor scooter? Miss Terry could have used it to get back to Frodham with. Mike just unloaded it from his van, you mean? Yeah. It was dark by then. Mrs. Beasley probably at her factory, too. So if Terry wore a... Snowdrop helmet or those plastic slacks, she'd pass for a man at a distance. But we still no real evidence to prove the connection. How do we do that? Find out about Miss Terry's early life. 
possibly that's where their paths first crossed. Oh, that won't be easy. Well, I imagine Lady Mathry would only have employed someone through a really good agency. So tomorrow we'll start on a whole lot of phoning. Lila! Lila! I've done it! I, I, I phoned this place in High Hoban, uh, Pamela Agencies Limited, and they know her. Well, after 23 phone calls, I should hope someone did. Mm, they weren't very keen to give her back history, but I spun them a tall story about locating her for a legacy. Well, come on, then give. Uh, right. Um, Terry, Edith, born Watford, 1932, attended Linwood School, Bushy, 4348, mm -hmm. trained as a nurse in Bridget's Hospital, Penge, 4851, first posed with a Mrs. Yarrow of Edinburgh, who died in 55, then employed by the Bellinger Clinic, Sloan Square, until July 59, mm -hmm. left for private reasons. Three months later, in late September, she took up her post with Lady Mathry. Well, it sounds singularly unsensational, doesn't it? Mm. One thing's a bit odd. Why did she leave the Bellinger Clinic, which is wildly opulent, for Lady Mathry? And why the three-month gap in between? Are we to ask of the clinic? Sooner or later, we're going to work right through her career. I suggest we start at each end. I'll tackle Linwood School and her background at Watford. You interview the head of the clinic. All right. I believe he's a very handsome doctor who resembles Herbert Long. Handsome? He was divine. I tell you, Jason, the moment I'm rich, I shall live at the Bellinger Clinic. Oh, never mind that. Did you find out why Terry left? Uh, yes, to nurse a sister up in Northampton. Then it must be true. What? The headmistress of Linwood School told me the same thing. Well, how did she know, for heaven's sake? It seems she was quite a friend of Edith's, ever since she left school 14 years back. Mm, I could just imagine Miss Terry writing letters to her teachers. Some people never leave school. It's thanks to those letters I got an admirable sketch of her career, at least up to three years ago. Well, what, what then? Then the letters stopped. That three years keeps cropping up, doesn't it? Yes. Anyway, till then, Aunt Edith was a paragon of virtue. Popular and clever, the joy and support of her widowed mum, who died in 49, and the inspiration of St. Bridget's, where she trained as a nurse. How did she inspire men? Meaning anyone called Potter. Hmm. It seems she preferred the ideal of service. However, th there is one extremely interesting fact about her. Which is? Her sister. Oh, the one she went off to nurse in Northampton? The same. Violetta. In 1947, the year before Edith took her school cert, Violetta disappeared. Don't tell me. Into white slavery. Worse. Onto the stage. Oh. She found some disreputable fellow in Godalming, of all places, oh, yes. who signed her for a fit-up tour in a sort of third-rate dancing troupe. Oh. From then on, she went from strength to strength, ending up at about 100% proof. So she'd taken to the demon drink. Like others before her in this harsh profession. However, in 1956, she found the Torcliffe Repertory Company and Romance. Romance in rep? Well, not quite in rep. In the variety theatre opposite. The gentleman in question was known as Marvo the Man of Mystery. They married. Don't tell me they lived happily ever after. Not quite. By 1959, Violetta was back on the old bottle, and it was then Edith was called in to nurse her. And, my Lila, Edith fell for Violetta's husband. Did the schoolmistress tell you that? <laughs> No, but uh, I can't see any other reason why he should leave Northampton and take up work as a laundryman in Sussex. You mean... Yes, my love. Violetta's husband, alias Marvo, the man of mystery, was christened Michael Potter. Jason! We've actually done it. We've made contact. Yes. Yeah, we've quite a case against Miss Terry, given just one really malicious witness to demonstrate they did fall in love during those three months. Violetta! If we can trace her. After the desertion, she'd hardly go on living at the same address... Still, there may be neighbours. But we don't know the address. Oh, yes, we do. Edith wrote to her mentor twice from there. Um, at Elm Cottage, Rinham, near Northampton. And tomorrow, my love, that is where we shall be. Oh, well, no need to ask if Violetta left. Place is just about a ruin. Mm, don't suppose it was much even before the roof caved in. Oh, what a place to choose. A mile outside the village. Only the one house it's opposite. It's not just a house. It's one of those country shops. Couldn't we ask them if they knew her? Oh. oh, well, the only thing is, how does one inquire if a passionate love affair took place there three years back? I'm not sure yet. We'll play it by ear. Come on, in we go. All right. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, young I wonder if you can help me. I represent a firm of solicitors who wish to trace a Mrs. Violetta Potter. I believe at one time she lived opposite. Well, yes, sir, but... Uh, uh, yes? Well, sir, Mrs. Potter's been dead these three years. Oh, dear. 
Most uh, unforeseen. Why, the papers was full of it at the time. Proper local drama it was, especially for us. You see, it was my hobby, saw the car plunge over. Oh, shocking. Oh, uh, one moment, Mrs... Uh, Cooper, sir, uh, Mrs Cooper. Do I understand the lady died in some kind of car accident? Well, I suppose you could call it an accident, but I always said one of these days the drink could get the better of her. You say your husband witnessed the accident? Oh, more than that. You see... Her sister, her name was Miss Terry. Well, she'd gone into the Thumpton for the afternoon while Potter stayed with his wife. Uh, couldn't leave her alone, you see. Right. Well, about seven in the evening, me and Hubby hears the most shocking screaming. And when we looks out, there she was, right in the front garden, threatening him with a bottle while he pleaded with her to go back indoors. Well, the next thing, crash! She brings the bottle down on his poor head, that heavy she rolled him to the ground. And then away off she went round the house to the garage. And before he could even pick himself up, she was backing the car down the drive like a mad woman. Well, he just got to his feet when she was off up the Wickham Road, the car plunging from side to side. Good Lord. What did you do? Well, of course, Hubby and me rushed over to Potter. And I tell you, his head was bleeding like a fountain. Sobbing he was. Follow my wife, he says. Well, Hubby's van being parked outside, there was off like a flash. And at the top of Wickham Ridge, looking down, they see her taillights and Hubby puts on speed. Eh, hey, well, that did it. Uh, did it? Yeah, oh, I reckon she saw him and put her foot down, too. Anyway, suddenly, about a mile ahead, they see the lights were right across the road, and the car go crashing through the fence above the gravel pit. Well, by this time, Obi and Potter was down the slope after her, but by then the car was aflame. Oh, mind, they pulled her clear, uh, but her neck was broken. I suppose in one way you could call it a happy release. That's just what Miss Terry said when she got back from the fountain. There was no chance, of course, that the car was at fault. Oh, Lord bless you, no, sir. The police checked that. Oh, uh, oh just one thing. Uh, it must have been dark by seven on a late September evening. How did you manage to see the quarrel so clearly? Well, with the porch light on and light streaming out of the lounge, the garden was lit up like, uh, well... Uh... Like a stage? Ah, oh, that's the very word. Thank you, Mrs. Cooper. Now, I wonder if you could give me the name of the local paper in which the crash was reported. Oh, well, if it's any help to you, I've still got the cuttings myself. Pictures of all three of them. You're welcome to them if you like. I don't like it, Lila. Not one little bit. Are you thinking what I think? That Edith Terry and Potter decided to do poor Violetta in? Could be. Yet something seems wrong... If they were in love, why live apart for three years? Or plot to do Lady Mathry in? It seems so out of character for the saintly Edith. Yeah, in any case, how could they have murdered Violetta? Edith Terry was in Northampton and Potter himself in someone else's van. Yet I'll swear something in that woman's story seemed wrong. For instance? Well, the lights, for one thing. A porch light on when no one was expected. And on a cold September evening, the lounge curtains still not drawn. Oh, I see nothing in that. Then... The the garage. I, I mean, look at it, well, what's mm -hmm. left. Can you see there's a, there's a door inside there connecting with the house? Of course I can. Then why didn't Violetta use the inside door? Why did she come all around the outside, the long way? She was drunk. Yes. Theatrically drunk in full view of the neighbours in a brightly lit front garden. The melodramatic blow of the bottle, the blood, the furious chase, and the blazing wreck. That damn smell of grease paint again. Well, I suppose it sometimes happens in real life. The victim makes a scene before she pops yeah. off. And... Lila, that's it. It? The victim. The obliging victim. Here, uh, l l let me see those photographs again. Yes. Now, look at this one of Violetta. We'll try to forget the makeup and the peroxide. Who does she remind you of? Well, she's not unlike her sister, except for the hair. Yes, that's obvious. But look again. Doesn't her picture remind you of someone else? Someone we know? No, not a bit. Well, it does me. And if what I think is right, it explains a whole lot of things. It explains a pair of cotton gloves, a rifle... A rifle? What rifle? Billy's, of course. And it shows me a magnificent motive for Lady Mathry's death, as well as why Potter was at Frimley. <laughs> We've been up the creek, Lila. Lady Mathry wasn't killed by Edith Terry at all. Well, Mr. Flowerdew, you're a lucky man. I've just been on the line to Somerset House, and they confirm the existence of the certificate you spoke of. So my theory holds water, after all. Yes, sir, it does. So what will you do, Inspector? Well, for one thing, I shall put Mr. Swain under surveillance right away. What's more, if we can get a permit, we'll have his line tapped. Now, let's see, it's Thursday today. Uh, Swain was supposed to have been hearing from Mr. X on Monday evening. That's right. Then by now, we should be well on the way towards getting the money out of Thrail. In fact, the supposed handover will be at any moment. I was wondering, 
Would you like to be in at the kill? Oh, it's Would? Better. Would? Good. Then if you'll hold yourselves in readiness, as they say, I'll be giving you a ring. Hello, Inspector. Here we are. So you caught your train, all right. Hop in the back, then. Uh, yes. Uh, what we can't fathom is uh, why we're meeting at Arundel. Sorry, I couldn't tell you more on the phone. The reason is that the handover is to be at Littlehampton, three miles from here. So you know? X rang Mr. Swain with his final instructions this afternoon. There's a 5th of November show at Littlehampton tonight, and that's where we're to meet. Clever idea to choose a time when there'll be crowds, and when in the uncertain light and with all the noise, no one will really notice. Do you know what time the handover is to be, Inspector? No, sir. Mr. Swain was instructed to mingle with the crowd, keeping the package under his arm. Someone will come behind him and take it, but he won't know when or who. If he raises any kind of alarm, the deal is off. Uh, uh, just, just a moment. How can you carry 50,000 in a package? Well, it seems Mr. Swain was instructed to convert the money into jewellery. Hmm? After we started tailing him, we found he twice visited a well-known firm in Hatton Garden. They told us he'd require them to supply a number of stones to the value of 50,000. He called for the box this morning. But, Inspector... If there are these crowds and the lights aren't certain, how will your men follow, Tom? Ah. Well, there, we've used a bit of science. Sid, to be exact. Sid? Switch on, Harvey. There. That's Sid. Sounds like a Sputnik. Well, in a way, it is. Sid is short for Sonic Informatory Device. A very simple transmitting signal. <laughs> Sorry, I'm no wise. Now, wait a bit. Once we'd explained to the Hatton Garden firm what was up, they collaborated with us in placing Sid in the lining of the jewel box. It's a tiny transistorized complex, rather like a jam pot cover. From now on, wherever that box goes, it's sending out a shortwave signal, which is being picked up by my patrol car. So the sound is coming from under Tom's arm at this very moment? Exactly, miss. Of course, Mr. Swain can't hear it. Only we can do that. But the moment the box moves, we shall be able to tell. You mean the signal will change its pitch or something? Yes. So we shall be able to tell whether the box is going north, south, east or west. And also, by the volume, we can estimate the distance. Oh, but it won't be a lot of use in a crowd, though, will it? Sooner or later, miss, the person who is collecting will come out of the crowd. And it's a hundred to one he'll leave Littlehampton. I have a car stationed on each exit route. The moment he passes, whichever car it is, we shall follow. It's getting louder. Now, that's because we're just outside the town. At this moment, Mr. Swain is waiting on the green, where the bonfire will be. It seems eerie, somehow. Switch off, Harvey. Now, I must ask you not to leave the car when we come to a halt. We're making for a side turning opposite the green, where we shall wait until the signal announces movement. But uh, what if we see Tom after the handover? Well, it's rather unlikely, but if we do, we shall take him in. He may provide just the information we need. What time is it, Harvey? Just after half past eight, sir. We shall be coming any minute now. Wind down the window. Yes, I can hear the band. Harvey, you'd better check positions. Sir. Control B Bravo 2020 two zero, over. B Bravo 20 to control. Standing by over. Control B Bravo 21 two, two, one, over. B Bravo 21 to control. Standing by over. Control B Bravo 2222 two, 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 over. B Bravo 22 to control. Standing by over. Control B Bravo 2323 two, over. B Bravo 23 to control. Standing by over. All cars in position, sir. Switch on the signal then. Now we have to wait. I win tonight. I say, I rather care for the rock. Inspector, signal train, sir. Which way? Eastwards, going towards Rustington. One, two, one. Control to be Bravo, two, one, two, one. Suspect moving eastwards. Stand by to report maximum signal. Be Bravo, two, one to control. Roger and out. Right, Harvey. Turn into the main road and make your way slowly along the front towards Rustington. Sir. Look, it's Tom, coming out of the crowd over there. And he hasn't got the parcel. Well, Inspector, what do we do? Follow him slowly, Harvey. When I say out, Mr. Flowerdew, we'll jump from the car and rush him. All right? Right. Out! He's seen us. He's dodging down that turn. What's wrong with him? Tom, come back, you fool! Tom, don't waste your breath. Get after him. Don't worry, Inspector. He was never very fast on the rugger field. Keep away, Jason. I'm warning you. Don't be a fool. Get him, Flower you. All right, Tom, you asked for it. Damn you, Jason. Damn you to hell.
Where are we, Harvey? A280, sir. North of Worthing Road. He's making for the Downs. B Bravo 2 to control. Suspect passing checkpoint 312. Riding blue scooter, wearing leather jacket, snowdrop helmet. Registration number obscured. All cars to follow. Now, Mr. Swade, let's have a bit of an explanation. I'm sorry, Inspector. I, I panicked. I didn't want this chap to see you get me. If he thought I'd... Hold on you... a moment. Listen. My God, he stopped. We've got him. Right, Constable, where is he? I'm sorry, sir. What do you mean, sorry? The signal was at peak pitch. He must have guessed how we were following, sir. We just found the empty box thrown out in the road. On the... Well, top me. What a pack of fools not to have thought of that. Mrs. America's old, sir. They've been trying to contact us for two hours. Seems someone rang Miss Terry at Frimley Hall just before six. Immediately afterwards, Miss Terry ordered a taxi into Frodham. We had two main tailor and a loser. That's all I needed. No indication of a meeting place, of course. No, sir. I have the full measures here, sir. I pray you fail me not. Ah, obviously prearranged, so we lose the pair of them. I wouldn't be too sure, Inspector. What? That's a quotation from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, rude mechanicals, planning a meeting. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Peter Quince says, I pray you fail me not. Then Bottom says something about rehearsing, and Quince replies, uh, uh, at the Duke's Oak, we meet. The Duke's Oak? That's the name of a roadhouse on the main awesome road. Well done. There may still be a chance. Come on, back to the cars. I tell you, Lynn, you never saw anything like it. The two of them were sitting at this table in the cocktail lounge. Then the inspector walked across. The moment she saw him, she stood up and she began to scream. I don't know if it was rage or fear, but it took three men to get her outside. Oh, how horrible. I'd say she was one of the few entirely evil women I've ever arrested. It's obvious Potter was afraid of her, as well he might be of a murderess twice over. Twice, did you say? Oh, yes, Mr. Flowerdew discovered the earlier one when he was investigating the family background. It's really the clue to this whole affair. I'm sorry, I just don't understand. Oh, I see, Lynn. I discovered that Edith Terry had a sister called Violetta, who'd been killed in a car crash. And what put me on the scent was that Violetta's photograph bore a strong resemblance to you. Me? Yes. So I did a bit of research at Somerset House, and I found out something which at last gave me the motive of the whole affair. I found that Edith and Violetta were your cousins. What? Don't you remember your Uncle Ralph who married that actress? What? His widow was left with two daughters, Edith and Violetta. The mother, with a love of the stage and a hatred for the Setons, changed her name to Terry. She knew about the trust fund, you see, and deeply resented the fact that the family wouldn't help her. My cousin. Now, the one daughter, Edith, harbored no thoughts of revenge. It was Violetta, who for years kept tabs on Lady Mathry and schemed out how a murder might get her the 50,000 pounds. Then, in 1959, came her chance. Lady Mathry advertised for a companion. Well, plainly, Violetta couldn't apply for the job, but Edith could. What's more, when the police investigation came, she would appear to have a completely blameless background. So she somehow bullied Edith into taking the post? Well, no, I'm afraid something went wrong. Uh, Edith either refused to be a party to the conspiracy, or even said she'd expose the plot. So what happens? Violetta and her husband rent a deserted cottage, lure Edith there with a tale that she's needed to nurse her sister, and then murder her. But what did that solve? It meant, my love, that Violetta could take Edith's place. But they didn't even look alike. No, Violetta was a peroxide blonde and Edith was a plain little mouse. But essentially, their bones and build were the same. Well, it's easy enough to dye one's hair brown, wipe off makeup and don sensible tweeds. The rest would be acting. And Violetta was a good actress. She became her sister. Except, of course, she couldn't write to old friends. But, Jason, how did they manage to make it seem that Violetta had driven off and crashed the car? I think it went like this. On the morning Edith was due to go into Northampton, in fact, she was drugged. While she was unconscious, Violetta and Mike bleached her hair, applied a heavy makeup, and put her into some tarty clothes. Meanwhile, Violetta dyed her hair brown, removed her makeup, and donned Edith's clothes. Then, as Edith, she took the bus into Northampton. I think she must have had a push bike waiting there in the public stand. As darkness fell, she cycled back by some secondary road, hid the bike near the gravel pit, and got to the cottage over the fields. No one saw her. Meanwhile, Potter had placed the unconscious sister in the front seat of the car, hunched up below the level of the window. When it was dark, he opened the garage doors. Now, all Violetta had to do was slip on a flashy top coat and a blonde wig, and she was ready to stage that loud, melodramatic scene in the front garden. So that was why the lights were on, for the neighbours to see. Right. She crowns her husband with a bottle and drives off. Potter follows with the neighbour. Violetta steers for the gravel pit. At the last moment, she jumps clear while the sister crashes to her death. All she now has to do is remove the blonde wig and the top coat, grab the hidden push bike, cycle back into Northampton. There, as Edith once more, she catches the outward bus and arrives to find her supposedly wicked sister dead. And so she was free to take the job with Aunt Nina? Yes. But remember, it wasn't going to be enough just to kill your aunt. 
you had to appear to be the killer. Now, that could only arise as the result of a row over the changed will. Also, you had to be invited down to Frimley and Thrale informed of the fact. Yes, but how could Violetta be sure that would happen? She wasn't. Your aunt never wrote that letter or phoned Thrale. And on that afternoon, you didn't interview your aunt at all. But Violetta, giving the performance of her life. But that's impossible. Don't you remember the room was rather dim? And that somehow you sensed your aunt was different? <laughs> Add to that the fact that Violetta had three years to study your aunt, and that to some extent she had the family features, <laughs> wasn't at all impossible. But where was Aunt Nina at that time? Well, in the adjoining bedroom, I imagine. You see, she'd been given some kind of sedative by Violetta just before she left at two that afternoon. As she sat in her chair by the window, Billy would merely assume the old woman was napping as usual. But later he saw her wake. Now think. Violetta caught the bus at two. She entered the cinema at half past, left shortly after by a side door, met Potter, they drove back to Frimley together and she was in the house at three. She then assumed the makeup and clothes of your aunt. While Billy was chatting to Bob at twenty-five past three, she lifted the old woman from her chair and placed her on the bed in the room next door. She then took Lady Mathry's place in the chair and was duly woken five minutes later. At twenty to four, she received Thrail. Next, she staged the quarrel. I suppose you see now why she wore gloves. So that only my fingerprints were on the gun. Mm. Also, hands are the one thing you can't really disguise. Violetta's hands were not arthritic. Yes, of course. Well, now, the moment you and Thrail had gone, she rang Billy to say she wasn't to be disturbed. That left her twenty minutes to put on her own clothes and cover them with a motor scooter outfit. Next, she lifted Lady Mathry back into her chair and, still wearing the cotton gloves, shot her. That would be, say, at uh, 14 minutes past five. She then opened the French doors and rang Billy to announce a supposed intruder. But the shot he actually heard was a second one she fired out of the window. Then she was off into the shelter of the trees and onto her scooter. It was certainly clever. And point of fact, she'd made two mistakes. The first was to tell Billy to bring his rifle. A sportswoman like your aunt would certainly have said gun. And the second thing was to shoot Lady Mathry from behind. If she'd really heard an intruder, she would have turned to face him. You know, sir, I hate to steal your thunder, but you've made one serious mistake I'd have thought a theatrical man would have avoided. How do you mean, Inspector? Well, you suggested the victim in each case was first drugged and then killed. Of course, I can't be sure about the first murder, but in the second, I can assure you the autopsy found no trace of a drug in Lady Mathry's body. So how was she kept asleep? Well, uh, <laughs> no, I give up. You should have inquired a little more about Marvo, the man of mystery, sir. He was a hypnotist, and Violetta had been his assistant. Miss Harker, when that bullet finished your aunt, she was in a hypnotic sleep. So that's why Potter said she felt no pain, and why Billy spoke of her as being under a spell. Oh, honestly, Jason, I've no idea how even to begin to thank you. No? Well, I have. You can begin by letting me bring my tiny stool and join your queue. <laughs> you see, it occurred to me that one day there may be disgusting progeny oh. who deny that their grandfather was ever beautiful or oh, talented. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. There is a gorgeous portrait by you to prove the fact. Uh, well, now, I do assure you, I'm quite unparalleled that. That was Jane Wenham as Lynn Parker, Frank Duncan as Jason Flardio, John Pullen as Tom Swain, and Marjorie Westbury as Lady Mathry and Edith Terry in Deal with Murder by Peter Cornish. With Dennis Graham as Inspector Davis, Nicolette Bernard as Lila James, Stephen Thorne as the American telephone caller and the North Country traveller, William Fox as Billy, John Ruddock as Mr. Thrale, Frederick Treves as Detective Sergeant Harvey, Mary Wimbush as Mrs. Cooper, Hamlin Benson as Mr. Frisbee, Eva Stewart as Mrs. Beasley, Jeffrey Matthews as Bob Hazelrig, Gerard Green as George, Andrew Sachs as the American motorist, Peter Bartlett as the waiter at the Raven. The play, which was recorded, was produced by Audrey Cameron.